All right, good morning. This is the Anatomy One lab review for the midterm at Daytona State College. The midterm is going to be from chapters one all the way through the axial and appendicular skeleton. So if we talk about chapter one, we talked about planes and positions. You need to know what divides the body into front and back, which is what plane? Class, what plane divides the body into anterior posterior? The coronal, a.k.a. sagittal, what plane divides the body into up and down, up, bottom, transverse, or horizontal? What divides you equally in right and left halves? Mid sagittal or median, and in parasagittal or sagittal would be unequal right and left halves. They're not going to ask you questions like what's the opposite of proximal and distal, but they'll be using those words that we learned in the actual the questions for the test. Okay? But they always ask the planes and they always ask anterior and posterior body cavities. So with the anterior body cavity, they want you to know that the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic is divided by what muscle? Diaphragm. The diaphragm. The thoracic is divided into the left and right pleural cavities and the mediastinum, and there we have the pericardium, okay, where the heart resides. Um, the lining of our anterior body cavities are going to be our serous membranes. If the lining's on the organ itself, the viscera is the visceral lining, and if it's on the inside of the cavity itself, we're going to call that parietal. And between the parietal and the visceral, there's a potential space where we have fluid to reduce friction, our serous fluid. Okay? The dorsal body cavity will be made up of the cranial and the vertebral, and they typically ask that either on a model or on a picture. Okay? Just review, if you can, the right upper quadrants, the lower quadrants, and review the regions, the nine different regions of the abdominal cavity. Okay? I doubt they'll have that on the test. Moving right from there, we move into the microscope. You will see a microscope on the test. You need to know all the parts of the microscope. It's going to be at least four questions. If you can identify the coarse knob, the fine knob, the stage, the substage light, the condenser, the iris, the diaphragm, the objective pieces, the rotating nose piece, the ocular lenses, the arm, the base, you'll be fine. Your total magnification is taken by taking the objective lens that is in the middle or in the back and times it by 10 for the eyepiece, the optic lens. So we have right here 4, 4 times 10, the minimal, <coughs> the minimal density or the minimal magnification is going to be 40, the maximum is going to be uh, 1,000. Okay? So that's how to use the microscope. No questions like the field of view. As your field of view uh, gets smaller as your magnification increases and no things like your working distance. That's the distance between the stage and your ocular lenses. And as your magnification gets bigger, your working distance gets smaller because the objective lenses become larger. I would review magnification, I would review resolution, and I would also review uh, contrast or dyes. There are three ways to change your light, the substage light, the voltage on-off switch, and the condenser control knob. So just review how to change your light. From there we went right into um, the cell. So when we talk about the cell, you need to know things like the phospholipid bilayer, uh, the plasma membrane, the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope, the nuclear pores. This model will be on the practical, and you have to identify the different organelles inside the cytoplasm. Whether we're talking about the mitochondria that produces the ATP, whether we're talking about the ribosomes free-floating or embedded onto the endoplasmic reticulum called the rough ER. The Golgi bodies are here, and you do not need to know the difference between lysosomes and peroxisomes. Um, they're indistinguishable on this model. If we look inside the nucleus, we need to identify the chromatin, where our DNA is, and then the, um, the nucleoli inside the nucleus. Please make sure you spell nucleus and nucleoli correctly. We only have visible chromosomes when we're dividing, when we divide during mitosis, and this would be an example of mitosis. Starting off, with, before mitosis, we have interphase. You know you're in interphase when you can see a nuclear, nuclear membrane. Yeah. From there, once the nuclear membrane disappears at the end of interphase, we have the centrioles moving to opposite poles. When we get into prophase, the nucleus is gone and we can see visible chromosomes. The chromosomes, again, are sister chromatids held together by a centromere. From there, once they line up in the middle at the equator and are connected to the centrioles by the mitotic spindles at the kinetochore space on the centromere, we're going to call this metaphase. When the centromere duplicates and the sister chromatins begin to pull apart towards opposite ends by those mitotic spindles from the centrioles, we're going to call that anaphase. This is late anaphase. Once we have this invagination or this cleavage for all occurring and the nucleus starts coming back and disappearing, then we start seeing that this is into telophase and we end telophase with two daughter cells that are clones of the original parent cell and they're back now in interphase. 
Now, during mitosis, during the latter part of anaphase or into telophase, we have another cycle called, called cytokinesis. That's the duplication of the cytoplasm. All the organelles are going to duplicate them. Mitosis is simply the division of the DNA. Okay? And that's what you need to know as far as the cells. Um, moving along, we also did histology. This is a good picture of going over prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And I'm not sure if they're going to have the models, pictures, or microscopes. They're probably going to have the microscopes you're looking through. Okay? So be able to look at them through the microscopes. Now, when we did histology, we talked about the three linings. And if you see a void, you see a blank space, that means you're talking about the covering. We're talking about epithelium. Epithelium can be squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. Sometimes they can have hair on them, and we call that cilia. So that would be an example of ciliated columnar epithelium. If it's one layer thick, we call it simple. If it's more than one layer thick, we call it stratified. If it's more than one layer thick and capable of being stretched, we call that transitional. And if it's one layer thick, but some are taller than others, we call that pseudostratified, because really it's one layer, but it looks like it's more than one layer. Okay? So when we talk about our epithelium, uh, know those things. Now, when we talk about tissue, you need to identify on tissue loose connective tissue, dense connective tissue, and specialized connective tissue. Again, here would be an example of cuboidal, which would be columnar, ciliated, um, columnar, pseudostratified, and this over here would be simple squamous. Simple squamous. Okay. The next thing we're going to identify is loose connective tissue. So know your areolar, know your adipose. I don't think they're going to have reticular on there. Um, I do not even have a picture of it right now. So no areolar, no adipose, no reticular. Our dense connective tissue is going to be our tendons and ligaments. I doubt they're going to have dense regular, but dense regular looks a lot like smooth muscle. Now, we are going to see a skeletal muscle slide. We are going to see a cardiac muscle slide and a smooth muscle slide. They're normally all together in one section. The skeletal and the cardiac are going to be striated or having stripes, and you're going to see the larger stripes in the middle of this cardiac called intercalated disc, and they're actually going to have to be branched to a degree. Intercalated disc will be a little branched. So look over those. You're going to see blood. You're going to see sperm. You're going to see compact bone. With the compact bone that we've already learned, you're going to have to identify by microscope typically the osteon as the haversion system as a whole, the central canal or the haversion canal, the rings being the lamella, the holes in between being the lacuna, which contains osteocytes, and the cannuliculi leading towards the lacuna. Okay? So this is an example of compact bone. This would be an example of cancellous bone or spongy bone. Now, if the haversion canals run up and down, running transversely would be the perforating canals, also called Volkman canals. Okay? Very good. So you're going to have compact bone on the microscope. You're going to see cartilage, probably hyaline cartilage on there. Um, and that's pretty much what you're going to see as far as the tissues. The tissues. When we moved into skin, you need to know there's five layers of the epidermis, two layers of the dermis, but you don't have to name what they're called. And we have epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis, also called subcutaneous. You know you're there when we have blood vessels. From here, you need to identify like the erector pili muscles, the hair follicle, the hair root sticking out of the skin, the hair shaft. We also see some sweat glands, sediferous glands. We also see some oily glands, sebaceous glands. We also see some free nerve endings called our naked dendrites, also some meisner corpuscles. We have some Pacini uh, corpuscles down here. And just be able to identify the model. This is either going to be a picture or the model itself. And from there, we then talked about bones. When we talked about bones, again, this would be another example of a haversion system with the rings of the lamella, the lacuna between, with the osteocytes, the cannuliculi leading to the lacuna, and again, this would be your artery, veins, and nerves inside the haversion canal or the central canal. So this will be either be a model, a picture, or through the microscope, be able to identify all of it. When we talked about bones, bones did a couple things. They gave us our frame. They also provided us protection of major organs. They stored our minerals. They stored fat. They produced our red blood cells. And they provided a lever for movement of muscle so that we can actually move from place to place. When we talked about bones, they have long bones. We have short bones. We have irregular bones. We have sesamoid bones. We have flat bones. And we have vermian bones, or, or sutural bones, as they're also called. Okay. 
breaking the skeleton down, we can divide it into the axial, which is straight down, and the appendicular skeleton, which is our, our appendages. Um, there are 126 bones of the appendicular, and there's only 80 bones of the axial skeleton. Most of them are going to be of the spine, and they're numbered C1 through C7, T1 through T12, L1 through L5. There's one sacrum as an adult, but there's five sacral segments, and there's one coccyx as an adult, but it can be anywhere between four and seven coccygeal segments. We have intervertebral disc going from below C2 all the way to below C L5, but there are no intervertebral discs above C1 or below C1. C1 is also called atlas, and C2 is also called axis. Starting with the appendicular skeleton, we can say that the pectoral girdle is divided into two parts. We have the clavicle and the scapula here. The clavicle and scapula articulate at the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, and the acromial end of scapula hooks into the acromion process of the scapula, which branches off of the scapular spine. This would be the glenoid uh, cavity or glenoid fossa. We have our supraspinatus and infraspinatus fossas in the posterior and the subscapular fossas in the anterior. That's how you know that this is a left because the glenoid is always lateral and the smooth uh, subscapular fossa is always anterior. Okay? From there, articulating with the glenoid, we have the humerus. The humerus or the humeral head is going to articulate there. We have the greater and lesser uh, tubercles here. And in the posterior elbow, we have the olecranon fossa. The olecranon fossa of, of humerus articulates with the olecranon processes of ulna when we perform elbow extension. Beautiful. Talking about this bone, since it is a long bone, we can call this body the diaphysis or the shaft. We can call this end the proximal epiphysis or the head. And the metaphysis would be here, and inside the metaphysis we have our epiphyseal line or our growth plate. Beautiful. From there, articulating with the ulna and the radius are the two bones of your forearm. The radius would be lateral and right end. Radius would be lateral. Of course, these don't match up. And the ulna would be medial. Radius moves the radial notch of ulna. The radial notch is on ulna, and the radial head moves on the radial notch when you perform supination and pronation. At the distal ends, we have the styloid process of radius, we have the styloid process of ulna, and this right here would be the radial head. We also have the ulnar head down here. Ulnar head would be distal, radial head would be proximal. From there we have bones of the wrist. You do not need to know all their names, just know that there's two rows of four. There's a total of eight carpal bones, five metacarpal bones for the palm, and five phalanges made up of 14 phalanx. From there we go into the, the pelvic girdle. The pelvic girdle is made up of three bones of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubic bones. As a whole, they're called the coxal bones or os coxae. We have the acetabulum, which is the hip socket, which articulates with the femoral head. And the roughened edge on the bottom of the ischium is called the ischial tuberosity. We also have uh, the ischial spine here. We have the pubic symphysis where the pubic bones connect, and along the iliac crest on the anterior, we have the anterior superior iliac spine, and we have the posterior superior iliac spine on the back of the ilium. Okay, this right here would be the iliac fossa. One minute left. Very good. From there, with the, with the femur, we have the femoral head, we have the surgical neck, I'm sorry, the anatomical neck, the surgical neck would be here. We have the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, smooth patellar surface. This would be medial, so we have the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. From there, distally, we have the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is medial, so this would be the medial malleolus. This would actually be the left tibia. The fibula would be lateral, containing the lateral malleolus fibula. From there, we have the ankle bones. We have tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges or phalanx. There are seven of these, and he wants you to know that the heel is the calcaneus, and where the tibia articulates, this is going to be the talus. Now, the lining of the outside of bone is going to be called the periosteum. Inside, we have the medullary canal containing endosteum, and from there, the cancellous bone. We also have inside the medullary canal red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. All right. From there, we have the hyoid bone, which is located right here, and if we have C1 and C2, the name for atlas and axis, this is atlas, this is axis, and this part of axis is called the odontoid process. Very good. All right. Thank you very, very much for the review. I hope you guys do well.